When I received the invitation to come and speak at this distinguished conference, I had two thoughts. Number one, this is the greatest honor of my academic career. And number two, are they sure they knew what they got themselves into? I'm so honored because more than any seminar I've ever given, this one feels like I was invited by my family to deliver a lecture to my family. This organization, perhaps more than any other in the country, is home to more people that I admire and more people whose stories reflect my own. Relatedly, because we are talking about family, I have no problem with framing this like a family discussion. And so when I say, I don't think they know what they were getting themselves into, what I mean is, I'm Uncle Brandon who always tells the truth. And so I'm going to use this opportunity to, for us to have a family conversation about what we're going through, about the state of the world, and about ways we can improve our work in this space. Because the stakes are high. We find ourselves in the midst of this terrifying pandemic that has been so costly and in the face of assaults on our democracy. And in this time, it is imperative that we fight this fight intelligently. And you might be disappointed to hear that there's a lot of things about the way we're going about our business that I don't like. So for example, instead of efforts at inclusion, I'm seeing a lot of people developing diversity factions. I see wokeness now becoming just as judgmental as the bigotry that it's supposed to be fighting against. I see people actively trying to benefit off of pain for their brands, for their celebrity. But the thing that I dislike the most and that I have no tolerance for in modern times is the erosion of this important idea called gratitude. That's right. What happened to saying thank you? You know, when somebody does something for you, I've discovered that thank you is absent in a lot of the narratives that we tell about success. And I think this has caused us to lose our collective way. In one of my research lab, we focus on genetics. That is, we're interested in how genomic and genetic information translates into phenotype. And as many of you know, this can be depicted by the classical model called the, the central dogma of molecular biology. Now, the central dogma of molecular biology isn't supposed to describe the whole world, but it gives us kind of a place to start in thinking about things. But when we think about the complexity and the enormity of life, and we think about the central dogma of molecular biology, right? it's missing more than molecular details. What it's missing is the power and importance of experience. And human beings have this thing called storytelling that we use that tells us what our experiences are. And these things color the central dogma. And so really we can rethink the central dogma as DNA to RNA to protein to phenotype to story. This thing really describes more experiences. For example, Take the health disparities that plague our communities. Genomic markers for disease are gonna be very important. They're gonna tell us certain things that are in populations that may leave us predisposed to certain disease. But as we've learned in many diseases like COVID-19, right, genomic markers are just the beginning. Without the stories of who people are and where they live, and that includes history and the way groups have been treated, we don't understand a lot about disease. But when I think about how stories play a role and how we understand who we are, I've been disappointed by how oftentimes stories in science are about individuals. When in fact, most stories of success are truly about multiple people and the way we interact and the way that fosters success. And I think that we can recalibrate most stories in that context. For example, 
I'm getting all these wonderful invitations to come and deliver lectures and talk to people about my experience. And when I do this, people ask me things like, oh, Brandon, um, what was it like being a homeless college student? The only answer is to talk about that experience in terms of the collection of friends who formed a force field around me. And the minute they found out what I was going through, they protected me. I didn't miss another meal, really, for the rest of my life since then. And in fact, they even did things for my family, right, who was far away, sometimes without even telling me. It's disingenuous to describe that experience and that triumph as anything other than the triumph of other people. When people say, Brandon, I'm impressed by your support of women in STEM. I could talk about the books I read, I guess, and maybe that's a little bit true, but that's not the story. The story is that I was raised by the most intelligent and courageous and creative person I've ever known, my mother. And so the idea that women don't know what they're talking about or that uh, women don't belong, I don't even understand that language. That's a foreign concept to me and I have no tolerance for it. When people ask me, Brandon, how did you build such a multidisciplinary research program? You look at genetics, you look at epidemics, you do computational work, you do empirical work. How do you do that? Well, the answer could be something like, well, I'm just very creative and dynamic. I like to think across multiple disciplines. But that's not correct. The answer is the network of loving and supporting collaborators that I have who support me, who taught me things, who've helped me connect to different disciplines, who I've learned from, and most importantly, have helped to cure me of my imposter syndrome. They've told me that I belong and they've encouraged me to push forward with my ideas. When people tell me, how did you get into writing? How did you make that part of your you know, instrument that you use to communicate science? I could talk about something about, I don't know, inspiration or something like that. But the truth is I got started in professional writing as a graduate student because of a colleague in a completely different part of my life, boxing. I have a boxing colleague who told me that I should share my really good insights with an online boxing magazine. I started writing for them, all right, formally as a graduate student, and I never stopped writing. Even more importantly, however, writing about boxing has helped me with my depression. And so this person has been integral, not only in my writing career, but in helping me deal with something right, that was dragging me down. Now, trust me, I'm an arrogant professor who thinks highly of my work the same way as everyone else does. But the truth is more important than my feelings. And the few successes that I've had will always be about other people. And I can guarantee you something, every single scientist that you admire, 100% of them can say what I've said. They can trace a lot of their successes to other people. Now, this doesn't mean we can't admire people. This doesn't mean that you aren't special for what you've overcome. No, 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 no. It's just like genetics. Genes are important. They just aren't the whole story. Because in my view, most success stories are gratitude stories. And by understanding this, we can reframe everything about why it is that we do what we do. Ask yourself, why do I fight for diversity and inclusion? Why do I want an inclusive uh, scientific prof you know, professoriate or scientists in other professions? Is it because of my ego? Am I trying to use this to build celebrity? Or are there better reasons? I hearken back to something that a dear brother and colleague of mine, Professor Zaki Sabri, told me. We overlapped when he was a postdoc and I was a graduate student at Yale. And he told me that when he gave his dissertation defense, he located his father in the audience and gave the defense to his father. I thought that this was profound and I borrowed it. Because what I do now is if, it, if I can't locate somebody in the audience, I imagine them there. Because at the end of the day, we do science for each other. And I do science for my family. And I think we all should. 
And this is truly how we overcome the barriers that we're facing and build a diverse and inclusive STEM society. Thank you.